Hello and welcome everybody to another Big Data London webinar. Uh, today we're looking at governance, security and compliance risks uh, when uh, handling data. So um, I'm Andy Steed, Content Director of Big Data London, and I'm joined today uh, by Sam Gillespie of OneTrust. Hi, Sam. And um, uh, he'll be coming. Uh, he'll be coming on with his presentation in a moment. Um, before that, I'd like to make you aware of a couple of things with the platform. Um, these sessions are designed to be interactive, so please ask as many questions as you like uh, using the questions function below, and I'll endeavour to ask as many as I can at the uh, time we've got uh, allocated for questions after Sam's presentation. Um, a quick note, housekeeping, if you lose the stream at any point, you shouldn't, but uh, if you do, just hit refresh in your browser and you'll uh, jump straight back in. Uh, however, without further ado, I'd like to welcome on our featured presenter for the day. Uh, over to you, Sam. Thank you so much, Andy. Also, 10 points for uh, saying my surname correctly. <laughs> Anybody who does that is in my good books. So let me know when this is coming through for you all. Okay. Uh, not yet. Ah, all good. All good. Good. How many times have we had to say that this year? <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Uh, very, very interesting topic and really looking forward to presenting this today and just kind of giving a little bit of our insight into what we're seeing with our customers and partners that we're working with in this topic. Um, really, this is something that we're seeing across the market as really becoming a big priority of our customers and partners. So what we're kind of really be talking about today is based on all of the different organizations we work with, what is their priority when it comes to running a discovery project? When they are running a data discovery operation or tool, why are they doing this and what are the key drivers? We're then going to speak uh, briefly about specific case studies, uh, customers that we worked with, why they use our data discovery tool and what the purpose was for that. And then we'll end by just kind of really giving an overview of the key steps that you need to go through in order to get this all set up. Uh, just to quickly introduce myself, um, I work for an organization called OneTrust who provides software for privacy, security and data governance. I lead uh, the data governance side of OneTrust, uh, worked with the organization for over two and a half years, started off in the privacy side, but now moved on to working on our uh, data discovery and data governance tool that we, we offer. So really excited to be here today and really interesting topic that I love um, speaking about. So I just kind of begin today by really looking at uh, what we see as the key priorities and why we're even having this conversation. You know, since we launched our data discovery product that customers are using to uh, find and classify data, we've really kind of spoken with a lot of different um, organizations to kind of get to the reason why, why now, why are they, you know, using a data discovery tool? Why are they running these projects? And, you know, there's no, there's no point spending too much on this part, as I'm sure this is an area we all know very well, but it is no secret that data is more important than ever. You know, particularly we did see that, you know, because of privacy regulations, because of big news and big publicity around data, we're really seeing that organizations are placing more and more focus on data handling, data processing, what data they have and how they're using it. And so this is why we are seeing a lot of organizations that we work with, for instance, progress from looking at just data from a compliance perspective to a more kind of broader data governance uh, program. And for a variety of reasons, you know, we've got more data than ever, using it in different ways, and of course, sharing it. And that is, you know, often driven by the fact that there are a huge variety of law standards, frameworks, that require organizations to have good governing practices when it comes to data. So of course, you know, GDPR, CCPA, LGPD in Brazil, uh, big data privacy laws, but we're also seeing more and more um, regulations and frameworks that require organizations to have good data governance and know exactly what data they have and for who and the classifications of that data. 
So for this reason, we do see that a lot of organizations have different but expanding priorities for a data discovery project. And it is a way more than not a variety of different kind of drivers as to why they need to use a data discovery product or why they are running a data discovery project. So broader data governance is something that we see a real shift to in customers of ours. A lot of organizations began their, let's call them data um, programs to be compliant with GDPR, but are now looking at the kind of the broader ways in which they are using data, but also understanding how they can get more value from that data, how as an organization we can use that data more efficiently and start making use of what is often an organization's biggest asset. So we actually see data governance as often the driver to a data discovery project. We're seeing organizations really want to start populating and building a broader data catalog understand you know flows and change analysis of their data through using data lineage and just in general uh, promote greater data governance within an organization and of course the key to this is understanding your data from a security perspective as well we are seeing more and more organizations whether it be for um, compliance with the framework or just to expand their security protections see more organizations looking to understand their data and know exactly where we have confidential and restricted data so that they can start actually putting into place a lot more protections on data that needs to be protected. And of course, privacy and compliance is always going to be a massive driver for data discovery projects. You know, you thanks to uh, regulations like the GDPR and other privacy laws that we see and we continue to see come throughout the world. There is a need for organizations to know exactly what personal data they have, for who, how long have they had it, what are they using this data. And so this could be a massive task for any organization, big and small. So a lot of companies are now looking at what tools can we use in order to automate that requirement. And so whether it be for privacy, security, or data governance, ultimately all these three areas as, long, as well as other parts of an organization care about data and care about where we have and what types of data we are and what are we using it for and what potential do we have with that data. And some areas are more kind of focused on specific elements to this data than others. But ultimately, we do have a broad scope of different requirements that need to know about data and where we have it and those other aspects. And so what we are seeing is that the key driver to this data discovery need that we see with our customers is that broad areas of the organization need to know about the data that that organization has. So there's a lot of kind of cross functional advantages to running data discovery and understanding what data that we have. And then when it comes to kind of looking at this in a bit more of a specific case, when we drill down into those different areas of an organization that need to understand data, we see that there's a huge variety of different use cases and business challenges that can be solved by through a data discovery project and using a data discovery tool. So a lot of these can be kind of cross um, area uh, use cases. Of course, you know, some of them are very privacy specific, understanding where we have personal information, being able to fulfill those privacy rights requests. But we also see that data discovery is going to enable uh, a huge variety of other different use cases, whether it be things like cloud migration, helping us to mask and encrypt data when necessary, and you know, discovering where we've got our crown jewel data. So really, every organization does have different uh, drivers to data discovery, but we do see some key areas and key use cases that are really presenting themselves as the, the key motivator for this. So moving on to look at specific customers of ours who are using our data discovery tool, we see that you know there are different reasonings, but these are some kind of 
key example use cases that we work with just to kind of share with you what were their specific drivers. Obviously, for um, confidentiality reasons, we can't name the companies themselves, but it kind of gives you an idea of the different business challenges that are, are motivating this. And starting off by data retention, I think across the board, this is something that we are seeing. Most organizations are really finding both a challenge to operationalize, but also to know what data that no longer meets their retention policies or their retention periods. And privacy regulations on top of internal policies really make it a key requirement that data that is no longer required or no longer permitted to be stored as per a regulation or policy needs to be either deleted or anonymized. So this is actually a business challenge and a use case that we've seen with multiple of our customers who wish to use a data discovery tool in order to understand what data we have and to classify it, but also get that insights into the data to then def see whether it potentially needs to be deleted. So when I think about this customer in particular, they had a huge issue with unstructured data. They had you know, thousands and thousands of files in an unstructured data source in a kind of SharePoint type system that maybe was stale or hadn't been used in a long period of time and so no longer was required but of it, often though that's those stale folders or data contain personal information it contains financial information it contains sensitive information and so there was uh, not only had it no longer been used for a long time it contained data that potentially we needed to be deleting and so for that reason, they used our data discovery product to really discover what data they had, how long they had it for, you know, when was the last time it had been used. So they could then start looking into um, putting actions into place in order to delete or put another action on that data when it is no longer required so that they are complying with their, with their retention policies. Access and control, again, is another area that we do see a lot of organizations um, look to put into place a more robust method in order to control access. A lot of organizations are facing the difficulty of finding the balance between restricting access to files and to data that we don't need to give our colleagues access to, but also not preventing them from being able to use that data for their job. Remember, there's a reason that we have this data ultimately. And so we need to give access to this data to those who require it easily when necessary to enable their specific function. And so what this organization essentially wanted to do was give the ability for users to be able to browse for data through our data catalog and then be able to essentially request access to that data. And then once that access is um, granted, that they automatically then actually get the access to the data. So not just a workflow for approval, but also then provisioning that access as well. And so through our tools and through integrating with their various different uh, data sources and through their um, access management tools, we were enabled to give their, their colleagues the ability to see what data that organization had, request access, and then actually provision that access to that data so long as it, as it met the criteria. And with our guidance that we provide in our tool through One Trust Data Guidance, it also gives kind of considerations that they need to have in place, whether it be because of local or national laws or also framework requirements, so that can help decide whether this access should be given or not and start kind of bringing in some intelligence into this process. When it comes to masking and encryption, this is something that a lot of organizations are realizing that, you know, they are using data for testing purposes or maybe also transferring data between systems and they are not masking or encrypting it when required. And, you know, we do see a lot of organizations realize that they have, you know, departments testing and using data, real life data for new projects or initiatives, but that data is, you know, potentially confidential or sensitive information. 
And so what this organization had was a kind of first large scale project to focus on better understanding the kind of their data ecosystem almost, let's call, let's call it, and actually kind of figure out, you know, how sensitive is the data that we've got? How much of the data do we have is linked to individuals? You know, how much of that data that we have is financial information? So they can start better understanding whether that data needs to be masked or encrypted when it's either moved between different data sources or assets or used for testing purposes as well. So really better understanding this data is gonna, was to help them you know, comply with CCPA and GDPR, but also comply with their own security and privacy policies when it comes to using this data. So this is kind of very relevant to the times we live in, but definitely seeing a lot of organizations run you know, massive cloud migration projects. I think this is something obviously that a lot of organizations were running even prior to the, the current year, you know, massive drive to move to cloud solutions. But obviously in order to effectively um, run these projects and also to understand, you know, the security that we need to be putting into place into our, into our cloud provider and what types of data we should be moving, we need to understand the data that we are going to be moving. So we've worked with a few organizations who are running massive cloud migration projects, but they need to understand exactly what data they have, the confidentiality, the types of data, you know, whether it's um, PI or non-PI, different other tags and classifications, so they can decide, A, what data should be moved and which data should actually be um, deleted rather than moved. And then also to decide then what security and features and other aspects of the cloud solution that we're moving to need to be implemented in preparation for the data that is going to be moved. Obviously something that is very much in scope for almost every organization out there that we work. So in fact, this is probably a business challenge for all organizations that we work with, but this particular customer that we're referencing here is a very large multinational organization that works in several different jurisdictions throughout the world. And we're really struggling to understand if the data that they hold in these different jurisdictions is compliant with the regulations and frameworks that the data is under scope of. And so what they really needed to get a better grip on is what exactly, what exact data do we have in these different countries and these different areas? Which regulations are they under scope? And what do we need to do with that data so that they are, so that we can move to be compliant with these regulations? And so the key to this was firstly really understanding what data they have and there's various different data warehouses and other data sources. Then using our intelligence with One Trust Data Guidance to give details about what um, considerations we need to have with that data and then start putting into place uh, projects and workflows on the back of that to improve the different aspects that may be under risk on the back of those regulations and of that data. So this is something that I think a lot of organizations are really starting to realize even before using a data discovery tool is that you know with this increased amount of data that we, we all hold and source and have, is that there may be sensitive, confidential, or restricted information that is stored in tools or in systems or in data sources that it shouldn't be there or is unexpected. And actually an organization that we will work with were looking to use our data discovery tool mainly to discover their, what, <clears throat> excuse me, what personal information they had for their GDPR compliance program but when they scanned a lot of their uh, data sources as part of this process, they discovered a lot more sensitive and confidential information than they expected and often on tools that they shouldn't be there. And this could be a really simple thing as, you know, you're using a cloud solution, has a free text field and, you know, your colleagues are entering in data into that free text field that they didn't realize they shouldn't. The problem is with free text fields and being able to upload files is that people can upload what they want there and we can end up with a situation where you know you have for instance financial information on a tool that it should not be there so this was really key to this project was being able to do that deep level of scan actually scanning the data itself not just metadata to understand actually what information do we hold on our various different tools 
and should that data be there? So this is kind of really based on, you know, some examples of what our customers are doing and the, the drivers for this. And when it comes to actually getting this up and running, again, there's kind of no one size fits all approach. But in general, when it comes to getting data discovery up and running and set up and actually meeting our objectives, regardless of what they are, we see kind of three key steps to, to doing this. Number one, we need to understand where do I have data? So what actual data sources or systems do I have that contain data that I need to scan? Step two, then what actual data do I have on these systems? So it's almost like compiling a list of our data sources and then targeting these data sources to actually understand the data on them and then number three, once we've actually kind of, you know, got our scan results, got that insight into the data, what do we actually do with that information? Almost like the so what, you know, what are we actually going to do with these results? And for me, number three is actually the key part to this because I think too many organizations put a lot of effort into running data discovery projects and getting the tools set up, but then they don't actually put the results into action. And then it's almost like, what's the point in this? So this is kind of really the key area. And this is where we're really looking to seek to operationalize data discovery. So not only just understanding what data we have, but then being able to use those results in an effective way as per our kind of use cases or our, our requirements as an organization. And as we've already discussed, these can really vary from different company to different company. So of course, once we then found out, you know, what IT systems do we have data in, then we discover and classify the data, we can then put this into, into actually into practice. So, you know, once we know where we have PI and for who, we can then use this information to then start to automate the fulfillment of privacy rights requests. So of course, most um, large privacy organ uh, regulations like uh, GDPR, CCPA, LGPD, and a few others that we see in the Asia Pacific region have requirements for organizations to be able to fulfill privacy requests when someone submits them. Now, this could be easier said than done. Like we said, you have a lot of different data and different data sources. And so most organizations are finding that if trying to do these requests manually and open tickets with IT owners and, you know, go around and try and fulfill these requests is proving a real challenge. And a lot of organizations also fear that they are missing data about an individual and that puts them at risk. So being able to use data discovery to actually start to automate the fulfillment of these requests is really valuable. And it can also be very, very useful for other aspects of um, privacy requirements. When it comes to security, being able to detect data that is at risk, um, that needs to be protected because it is you know, uh, restricted or confidential, but it's on a tool that does not have the right access controls into place, means that we're gonna be able to better enforce our access and other uh, control policies. And then of course, monitor the risks and the controls that we put into place on the back of those risks over time. And like I said at the beginning, beyond just, you know, what problems do we have this data? What do we fix? Actually getting that better, broader overview of the data so that we can actually start enabling our people to use it and use it for an effective way based on, you know, their different requirements. So building up that data catalog so that we can start enabling the use of data, being able to make smarter decisions when it comes to data and being able to visualize our complete data ecosystem so that when we need to make changes or we need to report, we're able to effectively do this through lineage. All of these different data governance um, needs can be fed from our data discovery um, tool. And so the actual kind of step by step to get this up, this up and running again is not exclusive to every customer, but this is generally how we see organizations get this set up. And this first step, I think, is something that a lot of kind of people don't realize is actually something that's again easier said than done. 
but actually knowing what IT systems and assets you have and that you can have data on can be something that organizations don't have that kind of central list of these are all our different data sources, systems, assets. It's so this is kind of really our first step to when it comes to getting this configured. So utilize different methods that are already in place to be able to then pull together that central list of all of your systems and assets. So maybe connect up to the CASB, to your CMDB, to your identity access tools in order to then actually compile that list of all IT systems, but also shadow IT as well in order for us to know what tools we need to be running data discovery on. Is then about actually running discovery on this, so actually being able to scan the data in these in scope systems and then through using classification and AI technology, actually be able to add context to that data and classify and tag it. Now, of course, appreciate that most organizations have a lot, a lot of data. And so probably the biggest kind of um, hesitation we hear is, you know, we've got a lot of data on a lot of different system. A lot of that data is very old. How are we gonna How are we gonna do this? You know, is this gonna take us twenty five years to get up and running? And what we really see is that the best way to do this to to do it at scale is to deliver it through progressive scanning. So once you've identified kind of what systems are in scope that we need to be actually running data discovery on then run sample scans against those specific systems. Remember, this does need to include both on-premise and uh, cloud-hosted data. And of course, we, all, we need to be including structured and unstructured data in order for us to get that complete overview. A lot of organizations we work with now are really focusing on their unstructured data as they're seeing that you know, they're building up a lot of data in these different unstructured sources, but they have no idea actually what data is held in these sources. So run a sample scan, have an idea of uh, kind of what data we hold on there, the classifications on there, and then those systems that we find that maybe we have a lot of PI or a lot of confidential data or a lot of um, you know financial data, if that's your particular concern, based on your project priorities, you can then focus on the systems that you then need to run a deep scan on and start rolling that out to other tools over time. And of course, then what you can do is do Delta scans to identify changes as they happen. Then once you have these data discovery results, you can then start driving insights into these data, into this data sets. And again, this is very much dependent on, you know, what you're ultimately looking to get out of this, these data results. Again, what we're seeing here are three typical insights into data that customers are looking to get from a data discovery tool. These are not exclusive ones, but we can see that things like understanding what sensitive data we have and you know where it's held, where is our most high risk data, you know what data do we have that maybe is stored um, outside of our acceptable use policy, what data do we have that we didn't expect that was maybe entered into free text fields. But then also, you know, what data do we actually have that we can use? You know, do we have um, particular data sets that we can use for analytics purposes? Do we have sets of data that maybe marketing can be using? You know, these types of not only what's our problem data, but what's also what's our data assets are really valuable insights that we can then use. And then, of course, it's about driving actions from them. And we already kind of introduced that in the previous slides. But just to call out some specific examples of um, actions that we see customers taking from their data. Number one, enforcing governance and security policies is really often a key driver and action on the back of this. So once we've detected data that is at risk, then actually initiating controls, you know, like encryption, restricting access and masking. When we detect, you know, documents and other data that is beyond our retention periods, then enforcing deletion or anonymization of those uh, particular data in their specific systems. Or when you have users that need to use data, ensuring that they go through an approval workflow, but then actually giving them easily access to that data when they need it with the kind of agreed uses so that we have easy access to data, but we're not you know, causing risks or issues for us. 
from the privacy aspect, you know, being able to use data discovery is going to automate a lot of your data map. So when we look at regulations like GDPR, you there is a requirement for you to have a data map or under Article 30 is a record of processing activities. However, just be very wary that, you know, data discovery is not going to be plug in, then your GDPR compliant. We do kind of want to make it very clear to our customers that data discovery is going to automate a lot of your data mapping um, requirements, particularly around the types of data that you've got and what systems it's held on. But there are still other aspects of your data map that will require other methods in order for you to populate it. Getting things like your legal basis for processing, who the business, um, who which third parties are providing um, a specific service if it's not directly linked and, you know, descriptions of the processes will still need another method in order to populate that. So I'd always be very wary if you ever hear someone claim that your data, data discovery tool will be able to produce your Article 30 record of processing automatically, but it is going to help several aspects of it. So what we will see is that a lot of organizations are really moving from a very, very manual approach to their data map to a more automated approach to it. It's not going to be that silver bullet, but it is going to help with a lot of the areas that we may that you may be struggling to when it comes to those specific requirements. And also sticking to that privacy theme as well is also around being able to fulfill those um, DSAR or CCPA requests when you receive them. So when an individual, you know, is exercising their privacy rights, rather than trying to manually be able to search all these different systems and speak with data stewards or different um, system owners, doing a more automated way in order to target scan these systems for an individual's data, and then being able to fulfill that request based on the type, whether it be provide them with the data, delete it, uh, be able to provide it in a portable format, if it's a right for portability these are kind of tasks that we can really start automating on the back of our automation or the back of our discovery product so really appreciate kind of just hearing uh, our insights into what we're seeing in the market when it comes around uh, data discovery just kind of really quickly to end just to give a little bit of an overview of who one trust um is are and how we can help so we're the most kind of widely used tool when it comes to privacy, security, and governance in the world. And the reason for this is that we have very strong technology that we invest a lot in developing and keeping up with the changes in the market. We've got well over 100 patents that you can search, and we also update this on a monthly basis. We have a very, very, very agile uh, development cycle to ensure that we keep up with changes in the market. But beyond just good technology, what we have at the back of this is also the insights and the intelligence with that. So we have uh, one trust data guidance that we research changes to regulations and um, kind of in-house experts to provide that guidance to you know what you should be doing with data and what um, things you need to be considering. And this we feed into our one trust platform. And then on the back of this, you know, the people that we have at OneTrust that are going to provide guidance to you are going to be there to really help with best practice. And they, of course, you know, certified as per the, the area that they are providing guidance for. As a tool, what we have is, you know, one single platform to really help you operationalize and automate security, privacy and governance. And so what this has is at its core, the ability for you to understand your data, where it is through our discovery um, tool, and then you know, know exactly what laws, uh, regulations you are under um, guidance for, and then provide the next steps on there. And this is all really powered by OneTrust Athena, which is our AI, AI excuse me, and robotic automation technology. And so what you'll see here is almost like then the peacock, as I call it, of one trust modules or apps that are then on the back of knowing your data and knowing your laws are going to help you with your different uh, privacy security and data governance requirements 
So we've got our privacy apps specifically help with your your requirements um, when it comes to data privacy, GRC and Vendopedia to help you with uh, governance, risk and compliance, and also with understanding of third parties. We have our data governance tools, preference choice there to help you um, when it comes to marketing, and then finally one trust ethics as well. All of this, like I said, on a single platform, the different areas where there is crossover, where we can collaborate, very easy to do that, completely integrated, meaning that you can actually benefit from collaboration between programs. So that's it from my side. Uh, really appreciate presenting this. Any more information, we've got um, our contact details there. But Andy, thanks for giving me the chance to present today. Oh, I think you're on mute, Andy. There we go. Another another famous line from 2020. <laughs> another 2020, another 2020 <laughs> moment. Um, yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. And um, I, I was going to uh, just make the point um, straight away before we, we have a couple of questions. Um, we've been asked about the slides and stuff like that and being on demand. Yes, uh, this session is on demand almost instantly after we've finished. So just go back in and you'll be able to watch it, rewind it, fast forward it, and uh, pause on any of the slides that you uh, that you missed or wanted to see a little bit more of. Um, there's also some attachments to this webinar, which you'll probably notice next to the question box. Um, uh, those have come from OneTrust, so um, they support what, what Sam was talking about, especially at the end, I think. So if there's uh, more information, you can also get it from those uh, attachments linked there. There's also a couple of links to a couple of webinars coming up as well, so, so do have a look at those. Um, I think my first question is going to be 2020 specific. Um, I've heard a lot about data governance. We've, we've talked to people on here about data governance projects, et cetera. Uh, and we're just about to go into another lockdown, unfortunately, in the, in the next couple of days. Um, is this something that people, companies should be looking at now, you know, with maybe restrict, you know, their, their, um, their actual, uh, you know, kind of business activities might be a little bit restricted. Is this the sort of thing that they could have a look at? Did you find evidence of that the first time round? Yeah, it's really a good question, actually. And if anything, we're seeing that, you know, the current events are driving the data governance projects because organizations are using more cloud solutions, giving people greater access to data from, you know, their home computers, um, using data in different ways due to the different climate. And this is really driving actually a lot of data governance projects because like I said, companies wanna make sure that people are using the data correctly, that they are using it in ways that are permitted as per policies and regulations, but also at the same time that they are using this data in an effective way that we can then get benefit from it. And in a way that they can do this from home as well. And so this is why we do see a lot of organizations look to expand their data governance uh, projects to understand what data we have and give people the ability to know that data, but be able to access that knowledge from home or from a remote area, which is why a lot of organizations are looking to use a cloud-based data governance tool so that if you know I as a data steward or as someone who needs to use data, I can log into the data catalog, view all the data that we have, and then start you know, looking at what data I can then use for my specific project or that I need to make decisions on the back of. So you know, we see as the core of a lot of data governance uh, projects to have this data catalog mm -hmm. as you know, a real central view of all data that you have but you've got to make this catalog accessible to people. And so this is why we see, you know, using a cloud solution for the catalog is, is going to be kind of really the benchmark going forward, particularly in 2020. It's, it's funny because my next question was going to be about data catalog. We've had a lot of questions actually in previous, um, in previous webinars. Um, yeah. So um, is, is that something one trust helps can help with as well? The data catalog, is that part of your solution or do you work with someone else with that? Yeah, so we recently launched OneTrust uh, Data Catalog as one of our, our, our kind of as part of our governance solution. So really is designed for customers governance programs to help give them this, you know, central 
uh, view of all their data to be able to build up a business glossary and terms and link that to the data and then you know have people be able to browse and request access to data and all of this can be if needed fed from our discovery product meaning that it's not this kind of huge task to get this catalog up and running but yeah really excited to have launched that um really kind of a, a, a massive focus of ours for this year and next year and on on the back of what we saw our customers doing you know we've got four i think almost five thousand customers now and so we saw this massive shift in our customers to we need to start really focusing on our data catalogs and so this was like our natural next step as a company and so yeah definitely an area we focused a lot on and would love to show anybody interested let us know and we'd definitely love to show you our data catalog perfect perfect um so um my my second my, my sorry my third question is is about um privacy and governance and where it sits um it, it strikes me one trust is in a bit of a privileged position because of that sort of peacock view when you're dealing with quite a diff- lot of different people within the business not just uh not just the data guys on on our side um how's a good how's a company that does this well set up who's responsible for it Do they have a team um is, is that sort of people that data people should be speaking to because yeah. um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll give you that and I'll give you a secondary question after the back of it. So uh, how, how are these people set up? Peter? Yeah, I guess in the ideal world, you know, every organization should have a team that's specific to its function, right? They should obviously, you know, have your DPO, but then also your privacy program management team to put that into, you know, into practice and a specific data governance team. And of course, you know, most organizations have security teams there. And obviously that's the ideal world and most larger organization, it works like that. And, you know, they're well-funded, et cetera. But in reality, that's often not the case. And so what we see, for instance, is that privacy is often under the kind of umbrella of security in organizations, or it's under the umbrella of um, data governance in a lot of organizations. And so, in reality, it is going to be based on, you know, the the company or organization themselves, how they're structured, you know, ultimately how, you know, what budget they have available as to who these different areas sit with. And so that is why we really focus on making sure all these different areas are in one platform and that there is a crossover between these functions, because in reality, not every organization is going to have a dedicated you know, data governance function, but they're going to have a need for greater data governance that may sit with different parts of the business to actually put into place. And this is what's really key. So, you know, ideal state dedicated, but in reality is very mixed dependent on the organization and you have to be flexible with that. Yeah. 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 And, um, and, what what's the key benefits do you think for data people i'll um i'll I'll make this the second to last one i think so uh, it's it's one of those difficult things um uh, that that are lots of tools that are you know kind of um making people do things correctly a lot of the time um have um and it's not not so much a tool it's more the concept of governance i think the concept Mm -hmm. of security the concept of lots of these things which puts an extra stage in some people's jobs, um, especially security, I think I think governance to a certain extent as well. Um, what's the um, w- what's the kind of thing that you can tell people here who are going to have to go to their teams and go, you're going to have to do this? What's the sort of benefits? What's the headline yeah. benefit they can expect off the back of it? I think you've really hit the kind of the point here is that you don't want to create unnecessary work and see, make this as like a disadvantage, which you know, often can be a challenge in itself. People hear, oh, privacy, God, that's going to cause me issues or, oh, well, you know, data governance, that sounds like, is that really necessary? And so the, the key to this is being able to demonstrate to the different areas and stakeholders that this is ultimately going to provide them with advantages and benefits. You know, greater data governance is going to enable their job to be a lot more efficient and enable better data decisions better privacy is going to help them you know down the road when it comes to you know uh, different reasons and so what this is about is showing them how these different uh, programs are going to benefit them 
but also how it's not going to create a lot of extra work for them. And this is where, you know, we've been very, very, very conscious with our tool to make sure that it can integrate into these different functions without creating a whole load more work and a whole lot of um, issues and problems. And I think that's the key to this, being able to integrate with these different areas without creating massive amounts of extra work and tasks that actually benefits from that. And that's that's kind of the key to, to what we do. Perfect, perfect. And I, I suppose um, it may you may have already answered the question um, with the data catalogs, but I was just gonna, you know, end on, you know, what what's coming up for OneTrust? What can we expect to see uh, in the next uh, few months, et cetera? And, you know, what what's exciting for you guys? Unfortunately, obviously on the backdrop of everything slowing down a little bit, but uh, yeah, so so what's what's coming up? Yeah, so I think particularly around data governance, obviously our catalog tool is really gonna develop out, but we a real focus that we're seeing as well is uh, specific functionalities and tools to help customers with data retention we're just getting basically every customer of ours say we need better tools to enable us to uh, promote our retention policies and actually put that into operation. I think we're finding that almost every organization we work with is struggling with this. So we're going to be developing a specific uh, module within OneTrust that really helps customers to actually put retention into practice to know exactly what data they need to be potentially deleting it and then actually being able to do it so that they don't you know customers aren't lost in this kind of maze of data that potentially needs to be deleted but you know in other areas of the tool all of our different modules and uh parts of one trust are going to have a lot more kind of um exciting features to come so you know it's it's just like keep an eye on us but for me i'm very excited about what we're doing in the space of our data catalog and also in the space of retention as well, because I think it's a, something that we're seeing kind of people are really crying out for and we want to really help our customers with that. Perfect, perfect. Well, thanks very much, Sam. Really enjoyed today. It's been great to chat. Um, I think we, I think we're about done for time, so I'm going to say goodbye. But um, uh, thanks, thanks on behalf of all the uh, sort of viewers uh, for your time and, and your presentation today. And um, I will, uh, I'll see you soon, and uh, I'll see you all again at. Uh, at a later date for the next Big Data London webinar. So thanks, guys. Thank okay, you. Thanks, thanks, appreciate it. Cheers, thank you, bye-bye.